Well, aren't they tremendous truths? And I trust those truths of the Scripture have ministered to your hearts already this morning. Let's pray together. Let's ask for God's help. Our Father, we thank you for the direction of your Holy Scriptures, even when it comes to what you want your people to sing, that you want us to sing the words of Christ. You want us to encourage one another, to instruct one another. You want us to exhort one another with your words, even as we sing. And we thank you that it's in those words, your words, that we find comfort, that we find a sense of true assurance, that we find stability, we find life, we find sustenance for our very souls. And Lord, we pray now that as we come to some others of your words, we ask that indeed they would have that very same effect. But we also pray, Lord, that they would not only help us as your people, but we pray that your word would come with clarity, with precision. We pray that in spirit power it would come and even give life to those who are spiritually dead. Open our eyes, we pray this morning. And Lord, even in these days, do that mighty work which you alone can do. And therefore, Lord, we believe you will get all the glory. And hence we pray in your name. Amen. Well, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have seen incredible scenes this last week of rising floodwaters and how they engulfed whole streets and homes in Ipswich and Brisbane. But perhaps the most horrendous scenes came from the Lockyer Valley and just at the foot of the Toowoomba Range. And how on Monday, midday and so on, afternoon, an incredible flash flood ripped through places like Postman's Ridge and Murphy's Creek. The devastation and destruction that, that, that swept through townships as a wall of water literally took everything in its path. All kinds of personal property and tragically even people washed away. And how perfectly good houses were torn to shreds and crumbled beneath the force of the water. One of the members in our congregation has told me how his brother who lives in Murphy's Creek stayed on their veranda, stood there on their veranda and watched cars, watched sheds, watched boats, bikes, tanks, whatever, wash down the flooded torrent before their eyes. And yet how their home survived the floodwaters whilst some of their neighbours' homes were literally washed away. Such a scene, that scene of floodwaters beating against a house and it stands and another is, is left in total ruin, surely, friends, reminds us of a story that Jesus told, the parable of the two builders. And this morning I believe it would be timely for us to visit that story, put our other series on hold, but to visit this story this morning and examine what Jesus has to say to us today through the words of his story. And I ask then that you would turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6, to one of the two places where this story is found. It's found in Matthew 7. It's also found here in Luke chapter 6. And we're going to read those few verses right at the end of chapter 6. Luke 6 verses 46 to 49. This is the story, the parable that Jesus told. Before he tells the story, he asks a question. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and 
hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This morning, friends, we're considering what I'm simply calling when the flood comes. And the flood has come to us this week. To varying degrees, it has impacted our lives. And Jesus here speaks about people having to deal with a flood. He describes a scene that does appear to have some rather amazing connections to what many have gone through themselves in places not that far from us this morning. Houses left standing, others totally ruined due to the torrent. Now, there are four things that I want us to think about as we unpack this passage this morning. We'll look at, firstly, the builders, secondly, the houses, thirdly, the flood, and then lastly, the end. Firstly, then, the builders. And here in these verses, as I said before, the parallel passage being at the end of Matthew 7, which is probably the better known out of the two passages. But Jesus is in this, this story bringing his famous Sermon on the Mount to a conclusion. This, is, if you would, is the closing application to Jesus' most famous sermon. A large number of people had gathered to Jesus to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. We're told that earlier on in chapter 6. And Luke's account of this lengthy and practical sermon provides an abbreviated version of what the fuller account is that's given by Matthew. But both Matthew and Luke conclude with this story of these two builders. Builders of houses who represent hearers, people who hear the words of Christ. There are two builders in this story of Jesus who stand for two types of hearers. And out of all the multitude who are hearing Jesus' words, that entire multitude can be divided into either one or two categories of hearers people and as we too here this morning are hearers of Jesus's words we are Jesus's hearers we can also surely say that this very gathering can also be divided up this morning into two categories of hearers you see we are all in this story this is not just a story about others this is not just about others in the flood. This is a story about us. This relates to you. It relates to me. Now this last week we may have heard numerous stories about how others have fared in the flood and many of us were ringing one another, weren't we? We, we, were, we, were, and I, we, had, we were inundated with phone calls, not only from some of you, but from people all over. And we're hearing stories about how people fared in the flood. Well, this story is about how you fare in the flood. This story is about you. And Jesus wants us to come away from this story and this scene of the flood asking ourselves the question, which one am I? Which hearer? am I? Which builder am I? What is going to happen to me in the flood? Notice now the way that Jesus commences this last section of his sermon in verse 46. He commences it with a question. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? 
So Jesus is concerned that there are people who have been hearing him, people in that multitude, in that congregation, if you will, who might even acknowledge him as Lord, but who do not do the things that Jesus has been saying to them. Therefore, Jesus is deeply concerned. It's good that they've heard him, but he knows that they have not been doing the things that he has been saying to them. So he brings his, as he brings this sermon to a conclusion, he doesn't want them to go away and simply say, well, that was a good sermon. Actually, Jesus, that was the best sermon I've ever heard. And then go on living their lives like they always have, not putting into practice the very thing that they heard. They hear him, but they do not do the things that they hear from him. But there are others there in that same congregation, in that same crowd, other hearers of Jesus who do listen to what he says and they actually put into practice the things that Jesus has been saying to them. So as we think then of these two hearers, let's look at the first hearer that he speaks about. He mentions this in verse 47 and 48. And he says, Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings, and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house. Now I want you to notice carefully, before we jump straight into the story, I want you to notice carefully this first builder and how Jesus describes him in verse 47. Do you see the first thing Jesus says there? He says, whoever comes to me. He comes to me, this one. Actually, it is literally translated. He is constantly coming to me. It's in the present tense. This person it has a personal interest and a connection with Jesus Christ. This person, this hearer, is not just on the fringe. This is not just an inquirer staying at a safe distance from Jesus. There is commitment here with this person. This is the one who is constantly coming to Jesus. This is the one who is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. This one is looking to him, daily relying upon him, waiting upon Jesus. This one knows that without Jesus, he can do nothing. And actually, he is nothing without Jesus. See, fundamentally, the first builder is one constantly coming to Christ. He's connected to Christ by faith. This is the very one that Jesus has been describing, really, all the way through his sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus also says, this is the one, secondly, who hears my sayings. That is, he's constantly hearing what I say. This is the person who's not just satisfied with a sermon a week, but this person wants to hear Jesus' voice all through the week. This type of builder listens to Jesus' voice through daily reading the Bible, for instance. Jesus said about these ones elsewhere in John 10, he calls them my sheep. And he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. I am in a personal love relationship with those ones who hear my voice. I'm in a relationship with them. But here then is the point that Jesus really is coming to in his story. The next thing is the very thing, really, that separates the first builder from the second builder. And that's what he mentions there in verse 47, the third thing. And he does them. So the words that he hears Jesus say, he does. Or we could say it this way, he lives Jesus' words. And again, friends, Jesus places that expression, as Luke records it, in the present tense. So this is the person who, by the grace of God, is putting what Jesus says in his word into practice. He is a hearer of the word, but that's not all he is. As James puts it, he is also a doer of the word. And again, in John 10, speaking about the sheep, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. That's not the end of the sentence. And they follow me. We go right back to the start of Jesus' sermon here as recorded in Luke chapter 6. We can see 
in what way they would be following him, what way they'd be doing his word. Look back at verse 20 as he starts this uh, record here. Lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Or in the Matthew account it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. These are those who really know that before God they are spiritually bankrupt. That due to their personal sin, due to their guilt in Adam, they are in a state of spiritual poverty. They know that before God they have no hope of ever pleasing Him by their own efforts. They may be out there and helping the neighbour clean up the mud, but those efforts will not help them get right with God. They are spiritually bankrupt in total need. These are those that Matthew goes on to record that Jesus says, not only blessed are those who are poor in spirit, but he then says, blessed are those who mourn. And he's not speaking about grief over the loss of a loved one. He's speaking about the context of spiritual poverty. They mourn over their sin. They are grief-stricken to their very heart over the fact that they have offended a holy God by their own sin. These are the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They have a deep, pulsating spiritual desires. They love Christ. They love His Word. They love His church. They love His people. They love to meet, to worship Him, and to pray to Him with others of the Lord's people. They yearn to please Him in their lives, even in small ways that no one else knows of, because they hunger and they thirst after righteousness. And they're not just concerned with outward obedience. Remember what else Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount? They're careful about sins of the heart. Yes, they know Proverbs 7 and the seductress. But it's not just the externals of walking down the street and going into the wrong house. They keep their heart with all diligence. They are aware of the issue of lust. They are aware of the issue of murder and where it actually comes from. They are not just about externals. They are, they are looking at the issues of the heart. They do not lay up treasures on earth. So if a real flood does come and take away all their goods, yes, it's difficult. No doubt is difficult. But that's not their treasure. They have a heavenly focus. That's where they're laying up treasures in heaven as Jesus teaches in this sermon. They're seeking as their number one priority Christ's kingdom and His righteousness. And they not only hear about entering through the narrow gate, that they have entered through that narrow gate by God's grace. And they are on that narrow way which leads to life. And the fruit in their lives declares what type of tree they are. Or these are all the things that Jesus has just been preaching about. The first builder does those things that he hears from Jesus. He's coming to Jesus. He's coming to Jesus. He's coming to Jesus. He's listening to Jesus. He's listening to Jesus. And he's obeying Jesus. And obeying Jesus. The second builder... His hearing is described in the start of verse 49. And it's the contrast because the word but helps us to see that. Verse 49, but he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house. Now that's interesting. Because when you compare that description to what Jesus firstly said about the other man, there's something missing. There's no mention of this person coming to Christ. Now he or she is in the gathering before Jesus, listening to Jesus, part of the same congregation as the others. But of course the big difference is that they do nothing with what they hear. They might enjoy Jesus' voice. They might really like the sermon they might think that that preaching is, is spirit-inspired and, and, and so wonderful. But they never put it into practice. That's the second builder. My friend, which builder are you? There is not a third category. 
You, you can't get into number three category. Number three category doesn't exist in the eyes of Jesus. Jesus says, you're either one of these. You can't be both of them, but you're one of either of these. We see then the builders. Secondly, now let's move and consider the houses. If, if we were able to put ourselves into this story, as it's described by Jesus, and, and we're able to be on the street there, uh, near the passing creek that's obviously near these two houses, and, and if we would look at these two houses from the street, we, we would look at them and say, well, look, they, they look very similar, don't they? From all appearances externally, they both very much look alike. But the difference lies beneath the surface. Speaking of the first builder in verse 48, what does Jesus say when it comes to this house being constructed? He said, Here's a man, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. This man dug, and he dug deep. Now those two words speak to us about much effort. They tell us that this man was diligent. Now let's think about the story in these days. In these days, there's no excavators, right? There's no backhoes, there's no bobcats. It's just the old pick and shovel, and probably not as good as what we've got. Pick and shovel, to dig, and to dig, and to dig, and to dig. And the builder was not satisfied until he had got all the way down to the bedrock. However far that was, he dug deep, Jesus says. And notice the language of what Jesus says here. It was on the rock that he laid his foundation. His house, you see, had to be connected to the rock. Now, though it's not the main point, we shouldn't take our understanding of this story from a children's song you might have learned in Sunday school. It is not the main point. But the Scriptures do make the analogy of Jesus Christ being the rock. Psalm 18 verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. He is my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. And we know, don't we, in the New Testament that both Peter and Paul quote from Isaiah 28 about Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And that's used for constructing buildings. Here in this parable, the rock is Jesus Christ, but specifically though, it is the word of Jesus Christ. That's the emphasis of this passage. Now when we read about the second builder, what do we find in verse 49? Well, he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation. So number two builder does not connect to Jesus Christ. He does not dig down deep. He is happy with superficial religion. He is happy with that which you can see on the surface. It doesn't go down deep. One man dug deep to lay the foundation on the rock, and the other didn't bother with the foundation at all, according to those verses. One built his life on Jesus and the words of Jesus, and the other built his life on something else. One on the rock, and in the language of Matthew 7, though it's not used here, but Matthew says, one built on rock and one built on sand. Now both remember, hear the sermon. Both listen to Jesus. But one is vitally connected to Jesus Christ and the other isn't. So here then is the basic difference between these houses. One has a foundation on the rock, and the other has none at all. Now, before we go any further, friends, what, what, what does that have to say to us? What, what does that have to say? What, what application can come from that that relates to us now as the Lord's people? Well, surely, surely we can see. We must diligently apply the practical implications of Christ's 
words to our lives. That's the hearer's responsibility. Not just to take the words into your ears, but it's to take the words into your ears and see by the grace of God them worked out in practice in life. So as painful or as delightful as it might be to listen to a sermon, you need to listen to Jesus' words to you even today. And in hearing that word, and you see from this story, in hearing that word, it is your duty before the one speaking to you to seek to apply what he says into your own life. Now, Jesus, in the first place, is speaking about his words in this sermon on the mount to these people. Yes. But that's not the only place, nor the only time, that Jesus has spoken. He speaks today through his word, doesn't he? He speaks when his word is read in family devotions. He speaks through the private reading of the Bible. He speaks when his word is preached even here and now. The wise builder is the diligent hearer. Not only is he determined not to fall asleep under the preaching, but he's determined to hear and refuses to, to live a shallow, unexamined life. The word is applied. Constantly coming to Jesus, constantly hearing Jesus, and constantly obeying what Jesus says to you. We've seen the builders, we've seen the house. Now thirdly, the flood. Now in Matthew's account, we're told that the rain descended. You look carefully in Luke's account, he doesn't actually mention that, though clearly it's implied. Luke's account, though, focuses on the concept of what we commonly would call a flash flood. You see, this story is not speaking about the slowly rising Bremer River or Brisbane River, that which comes up over several hours or overnight and then it peaks and, and then it falls with the tide and it rises again slowly in, in, in over a, a several hour period. That's not, what, that's not the scene here. This is the cloudburst and, and it's all the runoff screaming down the hills and the ravines and it's all converging into that valley and it builds into a wild torrent as was experienced last Monday in the Lockyer Creek, ripping through Murphy's Creek, Postman's Ridge, Hellenden, Gra Grantham and so on, devastating everything in its path. A wall of water, if you will, come rushing down into that which is otherwise a peaceful locality. Listen to the language of Jesus in verse 48. This is striking. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation of the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. You see the language there. The flood didn't just trickle in, seep in as it did to our place on Tuesday morning. The flood burst here against the house. That which might normally be a, a stream ordinarily that's gently trickling down the, the, the creek, it's turned into a raging torrent. This is the creek that bursts its banks. Whereas previously the houses along the stream might have been away from that water, what seemed to be a safe distance. But suddenly the, the floodwaters rise to such height. But now in the story, the houses are right in the middle of the swollen, raging flood. This expression that Jesus uses of the word waters burst against the house or dashed against the house or translated beating vehemently against the house. Does that not give the impression of a wall of water hitting the house? Now the thing we need to see is that this flood, this wall of water that came down the creek here, this flash flood that hit that, hit that area, hit both houses. We mustn't miss that. Both types of hearers of Jesus get hit by this flash flood that came with incredible force. 
Now remember, this is a parable. The flood stands for something. This is more than just a dramatic story. Jesus is teaching something to us in this story. So what does he mean when he speaks about the flood? Well, the term flood, when it's used in the Bible, is used in numerous different ways. Yes, it's used to describe the literal worldwide flood in the days of Noah that we considered last Sunday afternoon. But the term flood in the Bible is also used as a metaphor. For instance, David speaking of a time of great trial in his life. He writes in Psalm 69, I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. He's not speaking of a literal flood, but he's using it as an analogy to describe what he was going through. He was going through a season of great personal difficulty and he likens it to an overwhelming flood that went over him. That's a flood. For all of us, friends, the day of testing arrives. Sometimes it comes upon us out of nowhere. It's like a flash flood. It hits us like a wall of water. It's like a raging flood waters against the house. Suddenly we're being dashed against by this water. It can come in various forms. A trial. A temptation. A diagnosis that you get from the doctor of terminal illness. A bereavement in your family. Your own death. And friends, the point I don't want us to miss this morning is that both of these houses, both of these hearers of Jesus experienced the flood. Away then with this silly notion that if you come to Jesus for salvation, your life will always be fun and easy and healthy and prosperous. Away with that unbiblical thinking. Do you think that the only people who are going through chemotherapy right now in our world are those who don't trust in Christ? No. Trials and difficulties come to everybody in this life, including the true children of God, including in the language of this story, the obedient hearers of the words of Christ. There's many tragic stories that have emerged from this last week, but there is one story from Spring Bluff near Murphy's Creek of how a brother and his sister were forced to huddle together in the ceiling of their family home after the wall of water swept their parents away. And apparently the brother had punched a hole in the laundry ceiling and he pushed his 15-year-old sister, whose name is Victoria, up to safety after the water flooded the brick home at noon on Monday. And he went back to get mum and dad. But they'd been washed away. And poor Victoria had heard her mum scream. The dad, whose name is Steve Matthews, was described in a newspaper article that I read as an electrician and former pastor. That couple were found dead downstream on Monday afternoon. Now, I don't know them, but it's very possible that was a Christian family. Floods come to us all at some time. Christian and non-Christian alike, yes, more broadly. But thinking of this passage, it comes to those who are obedient hearers of the words of Christ and those who are disobedient hearers of the words of Christ. Floods come to all alike. Friends, torrents come. They rush against us and they threaten to wash us downstream. The test of trials is coming. No matter how talented, no matter how knowledgeable, wealthy, handsome, the storms of life will press against you. You will find yourself, I will find myself, in the midst of a raging torrent that press against us and threaten to crush us. We need to remember we live in a fallen world, a sin-affected world. 
Life is going to meet us this way somewhere along the way. It's going to wash against us. It's going to threaten stability. It's going to threaten to even flatten us in a heap of rubble. Personal storms, family storms, local storms, national storms, international storms, and then the greatest of all storms, the last judgment. Your whole life must be able to withstand all those storms. You see, the flood is whatever will erode and disconnect you from Jesus' words and your diligent and persevering obedience to Jesus. Whatever would wash into your life and disconnect you from diligent obedience to Jesus, that's your flood. Such a flood is coming. It comes in all sorts of ways to see whether your spiritual house is connected to committed obedience to Jesus Christ. It comes to test your personal connection to Jesus. Those floods will test. They will ultimately determine whether or not you'll dis lodge or whether you're anchored by faith in grace in our Lord to Christ what would it take to make you give up on your Christian faith what would disconnect you from obedience to Jesus when pressure comes and floods wash into your life, will your profession of being a Christian go? If one of my children dies, if I am diagnosed with inoperable cancer, will I dislodge? If your business fails, or investments disappear and you lose out big time financially, if your spouse had an affair and walked out on you, would you give up and let go of your obedience to Christ? What would, take, uh, 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 what would it be as a flood to take away that persevering obedience to Jesus in your life? You say, well, Pastor, I, I, I honestly don't believe any of those things would dislodge me. As horrible as they would be, I don't believe they would dislodge my faith from Christ. I'm resolved by God's grace to be obedient to my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. My friend, how will you fare on the day of judgment? That is going to be the most devastating of all floods that you have ever experienced through your life's experience here on earth. If you look over in the parallel passage, we won't have time to do it, but if you do, you'll see in Matthew chapter 7 that Jesus has spoken about the last judgment in this context where false believers will be told, Depart from me, I never knew you. He's just spoken about the tree not bearing good fruit, that it's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. We know what the fire represents. It represents hell. When Jesus tells this story, he's speaking about the raging flood. Yes, that could be many things, but surely he has the day of judgment in mind also. My friend, how will you stand in that flood? What will happen to your house in that torrent what will your end be which brings us now to the fourth and final thing this morning the end what happens to the first builder of the house that was built on the foundation that's resting on the rock well verse 48 let's come back to the story halfway through verse 48 we read and when the flood arose the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. When I studied this yesterday, I like 
wow. Wow, what a response. Despite the relentless force of those floodwaters dashing against the house, what's he say? It didn't even shake. That's what he says. This house never let go. This hearer never gave up on his profession. He stood firm. This house stood firm through all the storms of life. Whatever the world, whatever the flesh, whatever the devil, threw at this house, nothing could move this house. Why? Well, ultimately, the answer is because it's kept by the power of God. And that keeping by the power of God is evident in an obedient life to the words of Jesus. And ultimately, this house didn't even shake on the day of judgment. Why? Jesus gives us the answer why right at the end of verse 48. For, for this is the reason why it didn't shake, he says. It was founded on the rock. Because of the personal connection to Jesus Christ, A life lived by God's grace, sustained by his power. It was living faith that produced the fruit of an obedient life to the words of Christ. You see, the child of God has nothing to fear on the day of judgment. No need to shake, my friend. Christ has taken all our sins. And though I believe the Bible does teach that we will be judged according to our deeds, those are the deeds that prove the foundation. You see, our deeds as a, as a whole manifest our relationship to Jesus Christ and the presence and the absence of faith in Him. For faith without works, James says, is dead. True saving faith always shows itself in an overall life of obedience to the words of Christ. And due to that personal relationship, To Jesus Christ, the true believer, has no reason to shudder on the judgment day. But what about the second builder? Second half of verse 49. The stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Friends, it's like those houses in the Lockyer Valley. They ruined, completely collapsed. Jesus uses the language here of a great fall at the end. It's the word that we would say in English, mega. We say mega, it's sort of like nothing bigger than that when we say it in English. This is a mega destruction. Sometimes, some hearers of Christ, their lives collapse in preliminary ways before Judgment Day. A severe flood of trials comes into their lives and they give up on their profession of faith. Because that's all they had was a profession but not a possession. A young person who once stood for Christ and seemed so committed and so keen encounters a secular university and the profession of faith collapses. Men who once led God's people in prayer or stood behind pulpits collapse into a bed with another man's wife. Those who seem so keen and committed to Christ and so keen and committed to his church it's in their pursuit of their career or some temptation into financial gain their testimony is in ruins their their faith has been shipwrecked and yet others seem to somehow hold it all together through life's floods 
but they will eventually find themselves before God in judgment outside of Jesus Christ and they will collapse in ruin. In hell, they will be forever destroyed. They might have regularly heard the voice of Jesus. Maybe every week they heard a sermon. They may have religiously read their own Bible, but they never did what God said. They never turned from their sin. They never saw how they themselves had offended a holy God, that they were guilty before him. They never trusted in the work of Christ on the cross on their behalf. Whenever sin was raised, they felt uncomfortable. They didn't want to hear about it. They pushed it out of their mind. They pushed it away. The issue of sin was not something they wanted to deal with. They satisfied themselves with external religion. Maybe they went to a good church where the Bible was believed and the Bible was preached. And maybe they even liked the preaching. Is that you? God might have given to you stable emotions. That's a good thing. He may have given to you a determined nature. And you might be able to get through all your struggles and all your strife in this life. But if you are not in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if He is not the one that you are resting on as the foundation of your life now and your hope to get into heaven later, my friend, your stable emotions, your determined personality will not get you through on Judgment Day. You may be able to wing it in this life. Stand before the judge of all the universe. There will be no winging it there. That day will hit you like a raging torrent and it will belt against your house and in no time you will fall. The language of Jesus is very graphic. Right at the end there of his sermon and immediately he says, the house fell. Not that it endured for a little while. No. Immediately the house fell and great was the ruin of that house. Oh, my friend. In these momentous days in the history of our state, with all the tragedy that is around you, will you not wake up and see how desperate is your need? Are you so blind that you cannot understand the message of this parable, this simple story? You are a hero of Jesus. If the wall of water that cascaded down Lockyer Creek on Monday caught you and you got washed away, where would you be right now? Oh, my friend, today, if you hear God's voice, please, please do not harden your heart. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You have heard his voice. Obey him. Listen to what he says. And obey. Turn from your sin. And plead with him to save you. And my friend, he will. He has promised that all those that would come to him, he will not reject any. Come to him today, my friend, that you may be ready for all the floods but ultimately the flood that everyone will face. Let's pray.